This is a paper that I actually presented uh, at another seminar series in Manchester a couple of years ago when it was in uh, first draft and I got really valuable feedback from it. Um, Yaojun was there, so apologies, Yaojun, you're going to have to sit through this again. Um, it's been published in the Oxford Review of Education if you want to, to read the full paper. Um, and I was very lucky to uh, get some media coverage of the paper in the Times Higher. And in front of you, you have a, a spoof that Laurie Taylor did on the back of the, the Times Higher in the Poppleton News, where he affectionately sent up the findings of this, of this paper. So you've, you've actually got the answer before you, before I even begin. Um, OK, so the, I guess the background to this, uh, this paper is really the idea that, at least nominally speaking, we have a unitary higher education system. Um, the Robbins expansion of the 1960 created a, a, a dual higher education system with the traditional universities on the one hand and newly created polytechnic institutions on the other. But of course, then by 1992, the decision was taken politically to dismantle this divide between old and new universities and to create a single higher education system. So on paper, we have a unitary system. Of course, we all know that it's not really a unitary system. And that was really evident even at the time that the uni unitary system was being created. So the very year after this unitary system was created and the binary divide was uh, dissolved, you get the first ever university rankings straight away. And I'll talk a bit more about those in a minute. The first one was published by the Times uh, newspaper. And then the year after that, you get the emergence of these university mission groups, spearheaded by the formation of the Russell Group. Um, and I'll talk a bit about more in a moment about the Russell Group and how it came to be and some of the other mission groups that we that are in existence um, in the current higher education sector. The creation of these university guides straight after the abolition of the binary, binary divide, quite interesting. They're modelled somewhat on the uh, American rankings of universities that had been going on uh, for at least a few years before we had them in the UK. Um, created by, by journalists on the Times uh, newspaper and if you, if you get a copy of the very first edition, it's got a kind of foreword by the journalist who's, who created the, the, the guide. And some really interesting uh, things that they say that reveal the motivations behind uh, creating a guide of this kind. So one of the things that they say in their introduction is that it become obvious that all universities were by no means equal in the new higher education world that had been created. So they're explicitly acknowledging that this unitary system is one that people don't actually buy into and, re and, and realise that actually there's a lot of differentiation and hierarchy. They also point to the fact that with a very large number of universities now, a doubling of the number of universities overnight effectively, and an ever-growing pool of graduates, they're predicting that a pecking order will inevitably emerge, and that's kind of what, we're, what we've been seeing. So what they said this, this guide set out to do was for each of these nine, 90 universities was to uh, provide prospective students and their parents with um, indicators of some of the significant uh, characteristics and features of different universities to enable people to choose uh, a good university. And they're things that are in the, in the league tables today. They haven't really changed very much. Things like staff-student ratios, percentage of students getting a good degree, entry tariff, average entry grades, those kinds of things. Nowadays we have three uh, university guides knocking around. So we still have the Times uh, merged with the Sunday Times guide. And that uses, I think, I think there are nine indicators that they use. Uh, things like, a, as I've just said, stu staff student ratio, the academic entry requirements, the graduate outcomes in terms of getting a graduate job, getting a first or a two one, those kinds of things. And then there's the complete university guide which is more recent and that has very similar indicators to the, the Times guide. And the third one is the Guardian University guide. That's a little bit different because it's a lot more focused on the teaching element of, uh, 
assessment of universities, so there are many more metrics to do with student satisfaction, uh, learning gain, things like that. Um, and what these, got, what these rankings do, as you'll all very well know, is they basically weight the various uh, 9, 10, 11 indicators that are there, and they come up with a composite score, usually out of 1,000, and then they rank universities. And we'll all know that universities choose whichever of these three guides places them highest to report on the website, right? That's what basically what we do. And we all get memos sent if we've dropped a couple of places and everyone starts to panic. What's really interesting about these rankings, two really interesting things if you just look at the, them as data sets. One is that the, all three of them are really highly correlated with one another, almost perfectly correlated with one another. I guess that's not surprising because a lot of the, the metrics within them are quite similar. But what's also really interested, interesting is that if you correlate the rank of universities in the league tables with the rank order of the date that the universities were founded. That's really highly correlated as well. You're not surprised by that, I guess, but you might be surprised at how high the correlation is. It's really very striking. Okay. So enough about university guides for a moment. Let's go on to think about these mission groups. Um, the Russell Group was the first mission group to appear. Um, you'll have seen uh, the promotion of the Russell Group brand all over the place. Um, my university and your university are always talking about being members of the Russell Group. And that's kind of, that, I would say that that has ramped up in the last five years or so, more so than when the Russell Group was originally created. It was originally created in uh, 1994 by the, the VCs of 17 universities that identified as large research intensive universities and were also universities that had medical schools. Uh, there's no formal uh, history of how the Russell Group came to be, so it's all a bit anecdotal, but what I've heard is that um, all university vice chancellors used to come to the Russell Hotel for an annual meeting um, as part of Universities UK. The VCs of these 17 institutions decided to arrive a bit early and have a pre-meeting. And the reason they started having these pre-meetings was that in the previous RAE, the medical schools had, didn't, had done really badly, <coughs> embar like embarrassingly badly. And they wanted to come together to figure out how they're gonna improve their scores in the next RAE, and what can they do collectively to lobby in their interests as big research intensive universities with med schools. So that's basically how they got going. So these are the founding members. So Manchester was one of the founding members. Uh, probably a lot of the cachet comes from having Oxford and Cambridge in this group, I think. Is that fair to say? Yeah? But a, a number of other um, old, ancient universities with long pedigrees. Uh, all, only Warwick, actually, is a Robbins institution formed in, uh, as a university in 1960. All the others are Victorian or much older than that, all, all, all you know, well-established universities. <coughs> Over the following decade, three more institutions joined, and then, as you'll probably know, in 2012, four more joined, including my own institution. Um, I think a lot of people had thought that Durham was already a Russell Group University. Uh, same with Bath and St Andrews, most people think they are, but they're not. Uh, they kind of have the same sort of cachet to them somehow. But Durham, York, Exeter and Queen Mary formally joined in 2012, and they each paid half a million into the Russell Group coffers for the privilege mm -hmm. of joining, which is kind of interesting, right? To you and me, that sounds like a lot of money, but actually it's not actually. <coughs> it's actually probably a pretty, pretty good investment, I would say, uh, on their part. You may remember that those four universities, including Durham, that joined the Russell Group actually jumped ship from another mission group, the 1994 group. Um, 
you didn't ever really hear a lot about the 1994 group. They weren't so vociferous or vocal in the press uh, as the Russell group by any means, and that might be partly why they've fallen by the wayside. So soon after those four universities left the 1994 group and joined the Russell group, the 94 group disbanded. It had originally been a group that got together immediately in the wake of the formation of the Russell group to say, hang on a minute, we're research intensive universities as well. We haven't got med schools, but we're equally important. We need to get together and think about how we can collectively further our interests. Um, but that kind of went by the by. There are three other um, university mission groups in existence right now, and they're, and they're all currently uh, composed of entirely of new universities, post-92 institutions. So there's the one that you'll hear most from, because the chief executive is, uh, is quite vocal in the press um, and quite critical of a lot of government policy around widening participation and quite critical of the Russell Group claims often as well. This is Million Plus. This was formed a, a few years after the Russell Group. And it's very much about post-92 universities that really sell themselves as widening participation universities. And that's one of their core missions, to provide higher education opportunities to people from less advantaged backgrounds. And they're very explicit about that. There's another one called Guild HE, which is relatively new. Um, this is a uh, mostly composed of quite small institutions that, that are not universities in the broad sense of, of offering a wide range of subjects, but offer particular things in the creative arts, for example. And you don't hear much about them really either. And the third one is called uh, University Alliance. When it was first formed, it had a brilliant name, the Alliance of Non-Aligned Universities. <laughs> but sadly, they dropped that. <coughs> so they're now just University Alliance. And they present themselves as being very business-engaged uh, universities. But you don't really hear so much about these. And you never really heard much about the 94 group. It was all, really, the Russell group is the one that we, that we know as a, as a brand and a mission group. So what I'm really interested in is, given the nominally unitary nature of the higher education system, coupled with the fact that there are these university rankings and these mission groups, what can we say about the structure of the differentiated higher education sector, sector that we have. So here are my questions. First question is a, just a very exploratory one. Can we say that there are distinctive clusters of universities that are higher and lower on the status scale, if you like, broadly, broadly conceived? And in particular, can we say that the Russell Group really is uh, a distinctive cluster of leading universities as the Russell Group uh, regularly claims? Are they really the jewels in the crown right there at the top of the pecking order? If there are distinctive clusters, what distinguishes them? What, what are the key points of difference between them? Okay. All right. So I'm going to um, talk through five key areas of the differentiated nature of universities that I think are really crucial to consider when we're thinking about what's the structure and are the clusters of higher and lower status tiers. I'm going to just uh, tell you about the th five broad categories, first of all, and my reason for including them. And then I'm going to show you some raw data for all the universities in my data set. Um, and I thought you'd be interested to see how Manchester stacks up on some of these indicators. So I'm going to uh, flag up where Manchester is on all of these as well. So there are five dimensions that I think are important. The first one is research activity uh, within the university. How research intensive and what, what is the quality of the research. So I'm going to show you three indicators. First one is how much research income do universities pull in, adjusted for their size, uh, but also adjusted for whether what the balance of arts versus science is, given that science research is much more expensive than arts research, so you do have to make that adjustment. I'm also going to look at the percentage of postgraduate students in different institutions on the basis that this is an indicator of educating the next generation of uh, knowledge leaders and researchers. Um, and in the original paper, I, I also include um, scores in the 2008 RAE. I have rerun the analysis with the REF 2014 data in, and it doesn't change anything weirdly. I thought it might change something, but it's basically the same. Um, 
And I'm going to show you both 2008 and 2014 raw data in a moment. So I think research activity is really important. Second thing I think is really important in thinking about differentiation is teaching environment. Here I've got two uh, measures. They're not di directly measures of teaching quality, um, but they're one of the, the few metrics that we've got. They're from the NSS Student Satisfaction Survey. So it's percentage of students who are satisfied with the teaching they received and percentage of students satisfied with the feedback. Um, and then I've also got um, a value-added score uh, that the Guardian uh, produces every year, which basically is a bit like value-added in schools data. You know, given the raw materials, what are the what are the uh, uh, degree achievements at the end of the day, and and how does that stack up in terms of having added value, or possibly so having subtracted it? Hopefully not. Um, thirdly, I'm going to say that economic resources are important. Right. First of all, the wealth. There are wealth differences between institutions, and I'm going to capture that by looking at how much income universities receive annually from their endowment and their investments. Then I'm going to look at how that translates into spending. So per student, how much is spent on academic services, libraries, laboratories, things like that? Uh, and what's the student-staff ratio like? The fourth uh, dimension is academic selectivity. So how elite, academically elite, are different institutions. So I've got average UCAS points on entry. Um, and this will actually include not just people's A-levels, but uh, Duke of Edinburgh awards and horse riding certificates and things. So the, the numbers get to be quite large. Like It looks like people have got four, four A-stars on average. They haven't, but it, it's because I'm using UCAS scores rather than A-level grades. And I'm also looking at what percentage of students complete their degree rather than drop out, and what percentage get a, a first or a two one. <clears throat> and lastly, and I guess this is a bit controversial in a way, because this is something that doesn't appear explicitly in the rankings or in the claims made by mission groups about why they're so wonderful. And this is about the social mix of the student body. So I've got, th again, three indicators. What percentage of undergraduates are not from low participation neighborhoods? or polar, polar two categories. What percent are from the middle class, middle class families? And what percent are from private schools? All of this is drawn from uh, HESA or HEFKI or NSS data for the uh, early 2010s, uh, except for the RAE stuff. Obviously, that's a bit older. I've got data for 127 universities. I had to drop some universities where a lot, there was a lot of missing data. For institutions where there was just a bit of missing data, maybe 10% missing, I just put the mean, sample mean, in, uh, in its place. All right. So should we have a look at some of, these, some of these metrics before we go on to do something fancy with it? We'll just have a bit of a kind of univariate analysis to begin with. All right, so let's start with how much research income uh, universities bring in. The black bars are Russell Group universities and the red ones Manchester and then the blue ones are everyone else. So you can see massive variation across the sector in terms of how much research uh, income there is. The Russell Group universities tend to be on the high end but there are quite a few uh, non-Russell Group universities in there and a few laggards within the Russell Group. Uh, Manchester's a bit towards the bottom end uh, of this. Second one is percentage of students who are postgraduates. Again, this is quite variable. It's across the Russell Group. They're not, by any means, all 24 universities are at the, to at the, right, the far right of this graph. Average score in RAE. Most uh, Russell Group universities uh, did very well. But again, quite a lot of other universities are up there with, with the Russell Group institution. I'll just quickly show you. Um, a similar metric for REF 2014. Um, <coughs> here, all the top spots are taken by uh, Russell Group Universities. Manchester did pretty well. Um, but again, a few Russell Group Universities not looking terribly elite here. On to uh, measures of teaching environment. This is the teaching satisfaction score. A real mixed bag there in terms of how the Russell Group are doing. Manchester's not quite 
as far to this side as you might hope, nor is Durham, to be honest. Um, feedback satisfaction, generally lower for all institutions. Students are really unhappy about the feedback they receive. You guys, if you teach, you, you know this already, right? You're being told about this all the time. Um, and many Russell Group universities are actually on the, the bottom end of this scale with the levels of student dissatisfaction on this, on this, on this metric. Here's the Guardian value-added score. It's out of 10. And again, very mixed picture for the Russell Group, really quite spread across the distribution. <coughs> Here's um, the indicator of the wealth of institutions. <coughs> so Manchester's doing pretty well, has a lot of money um, swashing around. Um, there are but a number of... Russell Group universities are substantially dwarfed by some of the really big, we big wealthy Russell Group universities. You can guess who these two are, I can imagine. Oxford and Cambridge. Here's um, spending on academic services. So I guess Manchester's relatively low down here, given that it was up there on, on wealth. Well, that's a bit surprising. Um, but again, a bit of a mixed bag. You know, the Russell Group are all up this end, pretty much with the exception of a few, but they're not the only ones who are providing the, spending the most on services to students. Staff-student ratio here, obviously a lower score is better. And again, the Russell Group University is attending towards the, the, the better end, but a bit of a mix of other institutions in there as well who are performing best on this metric. onto indicators of academic selectivity. That is probably one of the metrics where the Russell Group can most lay claim to being in, in the elite, I guess, that they, are, they do occupy pretty much all of the top spots in terms of how well qualified students are on entry. And they're not doing too badly in terms of getting students through, having low dropout rates although there's a bit of a spread. And then percentage of students who are achieving a first or a second. Again, they tend to be at, at this end of the scale, but I guess you would expect that given the very high entry requirements, right? Okay. <coughs> so the last set of indicators are all about social mix. So first of all, what percentage of students are not from neighbourhoods where not very many people go to university. Um, Manchester's coming out quite well actually among the Russell Group as, as having quite a, uh, still not a very large percentage but better than the Russell Group average of, of, of students from low HE participation neighbourhoods. Um, and there, are, there is a bit of a spread uh, across that distribution. Percentage of students from middle class backgrounds the Russell Group generally is a middle class environment. And the last one I'm going to show you is about private schools. And here we see quite a <coughs> sharp <coughs> distinction between mo most Russell Group universities and everybody else. This <coughs> one is, uh, I think it's Queen Mary, University of London, the outlier there. <coughs> okay. Anyone want to uh, interrupt me with? Exclamations, questions at this point? Let's just assume that someone <coughs> is not in the university, in the third or something, and then if you are new, that's a given if you're an old university, let's say a very new university, how few and more clear are to compete <coughs> with satisfactory, uh, satisfactory support? And you, the basic idea is that you can't ask, you can't expect people from Russell Group's uh, universities to have higher support there. Therefore, this doesn't really measure the kind of underlying expectation you would ever do. Is that correct? Yeah, I totally agree that NSS is a flawed measure of comparing teaching quality across institutions because th the people filling out the forms only ever go to one, usually. Yeah, no, I agree. I assume that you um, submitted evidence to the, the 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 green paper call on TEF 
making that point. I'm sure lots of people will have done these. Are, these are quite flawed metrics, but there aren't any. There aren't many other things out there to use, so it's kind of uh, the best thing available at the minute. But I take your point, Jackie. Did you yeah, I just wanted to make the point. Um, but have there been somebody from uh, the senior administration in the room? Um, I'm guessing what they would be curious about is the position of Manchester relative to what Manchester sees as its comparators and or competitors. So my question was really about those um, data and graphs. Are they available to interrogate further? Um, a lot of it's from HESA's data that's published annually and you can download the spreadsheets. Some of it is taken from the Heidi database. Are you familiar with that? You have to have a, a, a login provided by your login. university to, to, to get. So that's not publicly available. Um, but I'm going to, s to see if I can make a version of the data set available for others to, to have a look at. Yeah. Okay. Just to say one. So as you stated before, a lot of these parameters are not independent at all. They're mm -hmm. highly related to each other. So it will be interesting in your cluster analysis to see how that is considered because especially when you do Facebook or forward analysis or something like that, you multiply the effect capacity of if you use a lot of parameters which are highly uh, related. Well, I'm not using principal components analysis. I'm using cluster analysis, which is a case-based rather than a variable-based approach. So as I'll explain in a minute, it doesn't, it's not a problem that these things are correlated with one another. Um, let me come on to that, though, and see if I can answer that. Okay. So, um, so you kind of learn a lot just by looking at, the, at those graphs, right? But I'm going to do something a little bit fancy, uh, and I'm going to use cluster analysis to crunch down these 15 indicators to see if we can identify these, any distinctive clusters of a university. Um, I'm using agglomerative hierarchical cluster analysis, and what this does is it, it takes each case and progressively put, joins together the most similar ones, the ones with the least distance between them on, on these metrics that are placed in the model. Um, so I've done, I followed fairly conventional strategy of measuring uh, the, the, the distance between each case, each university, in terms of the squared Euclidean distance, uh, having standardized uh, as Z scores, all, the, all of the 15 variables that are going to be in the model. Um, and the way cluster analysis works is if you think of, we've got 15 attributes that we want to ta take into account. If you imagine e uh, all of our universities having a particular coordinate in a 15-dimensional space. I want you to picture 15-dimensional space. I can't do that either, right? Mm -hmm. But imagine you could. There's a coordinate for each one in 15-dimensional space. And the idea is which ones are most proximate, which cases are most proximate to one another, and are the gulfs between this set over here and this set over here in, in these 15 dimensions. Can I just ask, <coughs> so how do you normalize them for differences in distance within a dimension? So that an individual dimension doesn't add much to the Euclidean distance by mm. simply having a larger measure across that dimension. So did you do any sort of form of whitening that the sphere in your multi-dimensional space is zero to one or something like that? Because otherwise you could have a strong contribution of a single dimension yeah. because it's just a larger distances between the universities compared to other dimensions. I just used Z scores to transform them. No, but I didn't. I didn't put re place restrictions on the, the 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 range. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah. No, I didn't do that. Would you recommend trying? Yes, I mean otherwise you might have one particular set of data that disproportionately influences mm. the Euclidean distance because it just adds a lot oh, okay. of space in that dimension. Okay, I'll give it a try and report back. But for now, I'm using Z scores. Yeah, just to. The idea being that they that they more or less contribute equally then to the to the model rather than because some are measured in in pounds, uh, some are measured on percentages, some are measured at much smaller scales. They're they're, they're going to be much more similar uh, by being z scores. Um, cluster analysis is um, it's an algorithm based uh, technique. 
So what it does is it walks through the data and, and, and fuses together cases um, that, that are most similar. There are uh, many, many different algorithms that you can, that you can experiment with, thousands of, of them probably. Um, I've tried four. These are four that are quite commonly used in the literature. Uh, they're also the first four that appear on the pull-down window in SPSS, uh, which is not why I use them, but I think that just indicates that they are quite commonly used. So I'm going to try and show, show you very briefly what these different algorithms do when clustering cases. Um, these, are the, these are the four that, uh, that I tried. So I'll, I'll just um, try and explain how this nearest method, nearest neighbor method of clustering works. Right? So all of the algorithms are the same to begin with. What, what they do is you've got your 127 cases in this instance. First thing it does is it takes the two cases that are most similar on these 15, in this 15 dimensional space and it puts them together. And, it, and then it looks for the next uh, most similar. It might be those two that have just been fused together plus another one that's really close by or it might be another pair somewhere else, depending on which, is, which are the most proximate. Where the algorithms differ is that once you start to get to build clusters, it's got to make some decisions as to how to figure out which clusters and which cases are mo most proximate. Yeah. So the nearest neighbor algorithm, what that does is, imagine we've got to a point and we've just got two dimensions here um, and just a small number of cases. What it does is it says, okay, we've got, we've got to a point where we've got three clusters. We need to figure out which two to merge. Um, so what it does is it, ca it looks at the distance between the nearest neighbors in each one. Right? So this point and this point are the closest two points in these two pr clusters that exist so far. And this one and this one are the, are the most proximate. So what, what, the, what, it would, what it would do is actually this is the shortest distance between nearest neighbors. So it would merge that one and that one before merging with that one. Yeah. So that's nearest neighbor. Furthest neighbor is the opposite. It looks at the furthest, uh, the, the, the least proximate cases within the clusters that have, that have been built so far. So in this instance, it would merge that cluster and that cluster because their furthest neighbors are closest. Yeah. Then there's, uh, I'm going to try the between groups average method. What this does is each point, each case within the cluster, it measures the distance between that and all the others in that other cluster. And the, so there'd be an arrow from here to all of those as well, and from, from this to all of these. And it would, the, the, the smallest average distance, it would fuse those. And then the within groups average one does the same, but it also looks at how uh, homogenous the existing clusters are, and it, pr it privileges those. It gives it's more likely to uh, choose very homogeneous clusters to merge with others than more disparate ones. Does that make sense? OK, great. Right. So I'm going to show you some uh, kind of diagnostic tools, first of all. And these are ways in which you can figure out which, if any, of the clustering algorithms that you've tried look to be good ways of representing uh, groups of, of uh, cases within the data. I'm going to show you first the, the furthest neighbor result, and that's the one that I actually think is the best uh, fitting algorithm uh, to this data. But let me walk you through what this, what this is actually doing. So the cluster analysis starts with each case being its own cluster. And then in progressive steps, it reduces down the number of clusters until all the cases are just one cluster. Yeah? Now, obviously, it's not that useful to say all the cases are one cluster, nor is it useful to say everyone is a unique case. What we're trying to do is to get to a point where we've got a number of clusters that's a lot smaller than 127, and at least a bit bigger than one, that, that captures well um, the, the variation, if you like. Uh, across the data set. So this axis here is telling you, given the dissimilarity between the cases on all 15 uh, measures, 
what percentage of that dissimilarity is accounted for by n number of clusters? So when we've got each uh, case is its own cluster, obviously those clusters are explaining 100% of the differences between the cases, yeah? And when all the cases are one cluster, that's not explaining any of the, accounting for any of the differences between them. So what we're looking for in this, which is, is called a, an elbow plot, is the point at which there is a sudden and substantial jump down. Yeah? So here, it, things are not changing much because it starts off by combining the most similar clusters. And then by the time you get to here, it's merging quite different things, and so you get very big drops. So what we're looking for is the point at which it starts to, to fall off. So I would say that this particular elbow plot suggests that there are one, two, three, four clusters in the data set, and that four clusters accounts for like 78% oh, of, of all that, that variation. Let me show you elbow plots for, the, for all four of the algorithms that I tried. This is the one that I just showed you, furthest neighbor, that gives a solution of four clusters. The between groups average one um, actually only picks out three clusters with a similar amount of variance explained by those three as there is by those four. Within groups average suggests three, maybe four clusters, but the, var the variance that those clusters explains isn't that, isn't that high. Uh, the nearest neighbor method doesn't perform very well at all. It identifies three clusters, but the, the amount of, they're, they're quite homogeneous, uh, sorry, heterogene heterogeneous clusters, those three that it identifies. Um, I'm going to go with this particular model as actually the, the best fitting one, but I'll show you that the other um, solutions have features that are quite similar in to, to, to this preferred result. Another way of looking at the cluster analysis results is to draw uh, a dendrogram. And this is the dendrogram for the, the cluster solution that I think is the best for this data. What this does is, you see all these short lines here? These are our 127 cases. And the heights of these vertical lines uh, indicate how similar the cases are as they're, as they're joining together. So you'll see the very short verticals here, and they get much taller as we move from 127 uh, clusters down to, to one at the top here. <clears throat> and what we've got here is this four, four cluster solution is saying, right, there's one cluster here, which is all these, all these universities, another cluster here, another cluster here, and another one here. First thing to notice is that the biggest divide is there are sort of two, two clusters here and then they subdivide into two, two more. The biggest uh, feature of the division is that most old universities are over here, and all the new universities are over here, and a few old ones as well. So that binary divide actually comes out as the sharpest cleavage, I guess, in the, in the data, which is, I guess, not very surprising. What we also see is that this set of old universities, when, it's, when it splits, into two, it actually picks out two Russell Group universities, not all 24. Do you guys know which two? Manchester and Durham? <laughs> <laughs> it's Oxford and Cambridge, right? And the rest of the Russell Group are here with uh, more than half of all the other old universities. So they're basically very similar to many other old universities. And interestingly here, what you've got is uh, a split within the, the, the new university <coughs> part of the sector with a group of 19 new universities uh, coming out as different to the majority of new universities. And I uh, 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 forgot to print out the list of who's, which universities are in which cluster, apologies for that. Uh, but I'll show you how they're different on the, on the metrics that were put in the model. Let me quickly show you the dendrograms for those other algorithms as well. So this is the one that we just looked at in detail that gives us four clusters. 
first thing to notice is that all four solutions pick out two Russell Group universities as a, as a distinctive cluster, and in all cases, it's Oxbridge that, that it picks out. Uh, the second thing to notice is that three out of four of the algorithms um, separate old and new universities, basically. It's only this uh, nearest neighbour method that didn't really work well on the data and didn't explain a lot of the variance with the solution that it, uh, that it, that it came to. It uh, doesn't really work. It's got a kind of very odd structure to it. Um, but the other three all clearly show old and new universities are occupying different positions in this space. And then two of the algorithms, um, this one and this one, both have this feature of the, the new universities not being one group, but actually there's a, a subset of new universities that are different. Okay. Does anybody want to comment on that before I go on to show you how the metrics I've put in the model map against these four clusters of institutions? Can I just say, so I think coming out of Oxbridge as those two separate ones, that's what I meant before, if you have a control for a single dimension contribution disproportionately, let's say it's the endowment, okay, because yeah, they have so many millions more, you would end up with a cluster like that. So a way to do that would be out of your, uh, how many, sorry, it was um, 27 or yeah. so uh, parameters, only put 20 in and then automatically leave a subset of these dimensions out and see how that varies okay. your results in the clusters. Because then you could identify if in the majority of those you would ed still end up with Oxbridge being separated, then it's a real value. But if it's only leaving one of those dimensions out, which is completely out of the result, okay. then you would know if a dimension is So take one dimension out at a time. Okay, yeah, okay, thank you, I'll do that. Yeah. As well as the zero one thing, or instead of? Um, I think the zero one thing would be even to a slightly different approach than, than the set scores. Okay. That's useful, thank you. Any other at this point? Yeah. I suppose I was going to come to that to say, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Christy, but the, the purpose of your study here, the investigation, is to find out um, from the entirety of the Russell Group University whether or not there were subclusters. So then that keeps us sort of falling out of this, isn't it? So I think what you've suggested is a sort of an next iteration. It'll be really interesting to see if that made any difference. But I guess we've achieved with your method what you set the point. You didn't know what you were going to find, but the method was um, suitable, so it could be refined in the way that you described it. No, absolutely. I mean, you're saying that there's um, disproportionate effect by Oxford and Cambridge because of some of the factors. Was that? Well, I think it's just it's very easy to generate a metric and then relying on it in, in terms of separation. It's obviously an interesting result, but you need to understand where it comes from, this sure. separation. And that that's, you know, it's going back then to the parameters you put into the space. Yeah, so the example being, is it just the massive endowments of Oxford and Cambridge that are driving the whole thing at the end of the day, or yeah. is it the other factors as well? Yeah, okay, yeah, I can definitely have a look at that. Okay. Um, let's just have a little look at, go back to the, the indicators and see which ones are really, that might actually get us part way there, right? Which ones are really separating out these institutions? Sorry, the text is really small, right? Um, so with it, they're in uh, reverse order. So the, these are the 19 university, new <coughs> universities that I've labeled the bottom tier new HEIs because on pretty much everything they're coming out as doing way worse th than the others. This second group, uh, uh, this second cluster is mainly new universities, but there are uh, a handful of old universities in there. This third uh, cluster is um, mostly, uh, oh sorry, is most other old HEIs, meaning it's all the Russell group except Oxbridge, plus a, a more than half of the non-Russell group old universities. And then this is Oxbridge. Uh, up at this end. I don't know whether you can see the yellow lines. I've just put in some yellow lines to indicate if there's a statistically significant difference between that box plot and the, and the next one down. So there is a significant and sizable differences between these four clusters on uh, research income, 
When it comes to how many postgrads there are, it, there's some simply that old binary divide between old and new universities. Um, likewise, on the RAE, uh, the big distinction is between old and new universities, but there are a subset of new universities um, doing worse still. On a uh, teaching environment, uh, there's a on teaching satisfaction, there's a, there's a binary divide, and Oxbridge is doing better than the rest of the Russell group. Um, but the but the the different clusters aren't so stretched out as they are with, for example, research income. They're much the averages are much more similar. And on fa feedback satisfaction, there's actually no significant difference uh, between the different clusters. Um, on the value added score. There is a significant difference between old universities on the one hand and new on the other. Um, and this, there's this kind of tail end of the new universities that are, again, significantly lower than most uh, of the other new universities. But I would say on the teaching metrics, that that's where there's the least uh, difference between the, the different clusters of universities, which is maybe surprising given the massive differences in resources and the, how uh, well prepared the students are and so on. Um, economic resources, significant differences between all three clusters, and uh, you're right that Oxbridge does have this massive uh, wealth that, that the other Russell Group universities uh, don't begin to match. Um, again, sig big significant differences in spending on <coughs> academic services to students, and significant differences between all four of them as well on uh, student staff ratios. Really big differences in terms of academic selectivity, very, very strong and, and statistically significant. The deg degree completion rate, uh, old universities are very similar to one another, um, but there's a big, the old binary divide is there in terms of completion rates, and again, there's this set of new universities that are doing worse than, than everybody else. Um, and likewise, with the percentage of students getting out with a good degree, um, significant differences across all four uh, tiers. And the last one, social mix. Binary divide, old and new, um, in terms of low HE participation rate students. And it's this bottom tier of new universities that have got the most out of everybody by, by some margin. Significant differences between all four clusters in terms of percentage of students from middle class backgrounds and as well in terms of uh, private schools. Massive, abs absolutely massive differences, in fact. Okay. So just to, um, just to, to summarize, <coughs> there are distinctive clusters of universities that correspond to notions of higher and lower status. But it looks like <coughs> Oxford and Cambridge are the, are the top tier institutions and that the Russell Group, all the other Russell Group universities are really very uh, undifferentiated from old universities generally. So the idea that the Russell Group represents the jewels in the crown of the sector is, is really a kind of branding, advertising, slogan rather than uh, rooted in you know, empirical reality, really. They're good universities, but they're, but they're not uh, uh, a pole apart from comparable institutions in terms of age uh, and so on. It's really clear that that old binary divide is there between old and new universities, and that's the strongest cleavage uh, in, in the data. Um, and a slightly surprising finding is that it does look like there is this further cleavage within new universities with some universities, um, some new universities doing generally worse on almost all of these metrics than new universities generally do. Um, the four clusters are really distinct on, definitely on four out of five of the dimensions that I've talked about. The one where they're least differentiated is in terms of these measures of teaching quality, but as we know, measuring teaching quality 
that we don't do that very well, right? And the, and the indicators that are in there are not really great measures of, of that. But to the extent that they are measures of something to do with teaching quality, there's much less variation across uh, the clusters than you, than you would expect, given how different they are on these other indicators. Um, these divisions aren't new, and we all knew about them uh, before we arrived in this room and have known about them for a long time. But I think what's going to be really interesting is to see uh, whether they've sharpened over time and whether they will sharpen over time, particularly if we get into a situation where the cap on fees is lifted and some universities uh, have a go at seeing, at testing the market and seeing how much they can charge for their institutions, for their, for their courses. I predict that Oxford and Cambridge will have no problem jumping to 16,000. What will be really interesting to see is whether the Russell Group, other Russell Group universities can utilise this brand that they've got to uh, follow in the slipstream of Oxford and Cambridge on tuition fees. All right, I'll stop there and welcome your questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you.